Yes. Good evening, guten Abend, dobry vecher. Um, almost one year ago, in February 22, Russia invaded Ukraine, as you all know, and this invasion has brought back full-scale war to Europe. It is this sad anniversary that brings us here tonight, and uh, here at Kerber Forum in Hamburg, but also in the live stream online. Thank you very much for joining us for this debate on Ukraine and beyond the year in war. I'm Gabriela Voidelko. I'm the head of the History and Politics Department at Kerber Stiftung, and I will be your host for the next one and a half hours. So what are the consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, for Ukraine and its people? Which ide ideological and political preconditions do we have to keep in mind when we talk about the Russian aggression and how has the war changed our perception of Ukraine here in Germany. This is what we are going to talk about tonight here on the panel, but also with you, our audience here in the room. We have three remarkable guests with us tonight, um, which is uh, Gwendolyn Sasse, Einstein Professor for Comparative Studies on Democracy and Authorit Authoritarianism, I'm very sorry, and of course the director of the Berlin-based Center for East European and Inter International Studies. A very warm welcome to you, Gwendolyn. Thank you. We have Irina Sklokina with us. Uh, Irina is a Ukrainian historian, a, citizen, a born citizen of Kharkiv, and specializing in, Ukra in, in the industrial heritage and cultures of remembrance in Ukraine. At the moment, Irina is based in Regensburg with a short-term fellowship, but very soon, she told us, uh, previously, she will go back to Lviv in Ukraine, where she works at the Center for Urban History. Very warm wel welcome also to you, Irina. <laughs> and then, last but not least, Robin Hinch is with us, internationally, internationally renowned photographer with a lot of passion, if I may say, for socio-economic and political topics and a long-term photographic observer of Ukraine. Thank you, Robin, for being with us. So, as we will be talking uh, a lot about the consequences of the ongoing war against Ukraine on many different levels, I'd like to start our debate with a, some kind of or a short, a small selection of visual impressions, which uh, the photographer Robin Hinge has collected in Ukraine since February last year. Robin, will you join me on stage so that we can start <laughs> talking and uh, having a look at your pictures? Yes. Um, Robin, you've been photographing in Ukraine since 2010. And um, when Russia invaded last year, you decided very early in March that you needed to go back to Ukraine. You drove to Lviv, to Ivano-Frankivsk, to Odessa, Mykolaiv, and on Kiev. The photos you took contribute to a very long-term photographic project that you have called Kovic. Can you, before we start talking about what we see here, why the name Kovic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. But to ask, uh, answer your question, Kovic is just for me like a strange abbreviation of the, of the time um, being in Ukraine. Because first of all, maybe the, no, it's still. Mm -hmm. um, 
First of all, I started in 2010. It was inspired by the, so let's say, call it the election of Viktor Yanukovych. Mm -hmm. And because I was not very fluent in Ukrainian or uh, Russian, I was, uh, after coming back after the first three months I spent there, um, I was thinking about some kind of working title. And at mm -hmm. the end, it stayed Kovic because I was all the time misunderstanding. I will not say the maybe... Ukrainian uh, bad word, which I was misunderstanding. Okay. I, I understood it as the name for the so-called uh, president. And then so far, Kovic stayed with me and it's some kind of working title. Okay, Kovic <laughs> stayed with you mm. because you thought it was Yanukovych. All right. So the first picture we see here we've chosen is from Kiev. Um, what do we see here and why is the picture important to you? Why have you included it into your project? Yeah, this picture is very important, very special to me because I was traveling through Ukraine in 2022 since like early beginning, as you said, in March, like third or sixth, I think. And I was traveling around and trying to make sense for myself of the whole situation. And I heard about the battles. Sometimes I came close. I saw tanks. I saw soldiers. I visited the positions. And it was like uh, more or less, let's say, the same as it was in 2014-15 mm -hmm. when the um, war for the so-called People's Republics um, mm -hmm. started. And then in that time, um, Kiev was almost encircled. And I spent uh, some days. Um, in the city, and this was the day when, like, the first or one of the first um, long distance missiles hit um, mm -hmm. Kiev, and it was in this uh, shopping center called uh, Retroville, and it's uh, maybe seven kilometers outside the, the main city center, like mm -hmm. the uh, Maidan place, where also the Euromaidan revolution was going on. And for me, it's like this uncertainty of. Um, uh, being or for the, the uncertainty for the for the people who are living in this kind of cities because if you have a front line you still know where probably the enemy is but mm -hmm. if the um, rockets are just coming from the sky and you don't know mm -hmm. how to behave maybe at that point of time the people didn't have the knowledge about what, what to do if there's really like to really proper react to to an air alarm or something yeah Mm -hmm. That was the, or this is the reason why it was so important to me because it's like the strike from the air and um, mm -hmm. in this overwhelming um, uh, measure of uh, outcome. Mm. It's also, as we see in the background, it's this contrast between destruction and then there are buildings in the background, which is uh, residential buildings mm -hmm. of the area, which are non-destroyed. So it's also this uh, this uh, yeah. opposition. So no, it was also for me in the project. Because we, we see it so many times. Like uh oh, oh, we have a we have a sound problem. I think, is it us or is it? Maybe we have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Rob. No, it's like I was or I was visiting, as I said, the positions and like focusing like really on the on the battle. But this is also I don't know what to do. Yeah, we don't know what to do. <laughs> we need our tech. Our engineer to help us a bit. So back to the good old. Hand microphone. That's try this one. Okay. Um, so for me, it was always or is still very important what really happens to the um, uh, to the population besides mm -hmm. the soldiers. Of course, like we know or we hear every day the stories about how many soldiers died at the front line from mm -hmm. both sides and how like man wave after man wave is coming mm -hmm. to the front and is dying, but. And this is, we all know, too, that there's a lot of civilians are dying, but it's like um, this really visually heavy impact about this uh, rocket mm -hmm. war, which is new. So mm -hmm. um, this is very yeah, important to me. This leads us, I think, to the next, um, to the next picture, which is uh, you just talked about the impact of, mm -hmm. the, of the rocket war. Um, uh, this is a picture which shows the power of destruction yeah. as well. What do we see here? It's uh, next to another big um, 
shopping um, center also in the Kiev region. But for me, this uh, picture, it was more or less right after a strike, like the last picture. But it's also about, um, about uh, the heat of this. Um, it's really about the explosion and how it mm -hmm. uh, deformates like the structure of normal living conditions. So it's not a tank or a military mm -hmm. um, training site or like a, a caserne or something like this, like a, a, mm -hmm. a barrack of the soldiers. It's like uh, actually a food storage facility and it was destroyed and it's still burning and it's like this metal, you need a lot of heat to deform it like this and mm -hmm. um, to really show like this uh, heavy brutality of the of the missile of a missile strike mm -hmm. because we it's always for me too important to to um, to think also the pictures we already already know within the pictures so we know or we have seen the pictures of people who are in the hospitals mm -hmm. and stuff like this but for me it's also like that to make uh, to photograph pictures which can um, work or function as a starting point for thoughts which are starting from this so mm -hmm. you, you have to think about um, what could happen to the people next to this how is this power um, mm -hmm. influencing them and um, yeah you've been talking about the, of, about people uh, so that you are interested in in what the war does to people uh, when we talked about your photogra photographs before our discussion. You told me that the man we are seeing here, I think his name is Andri. Andri, yeah. And um, can you tell us a bit about Andri? Um, yeah, Andri, I, I, I met him in the, in the village um, in Borodjanka. It's also like a suburb of Kiev, or yeah, it's a suburb. And I was walking around this village just more or less right after the liberation of the city, mm -hmm. so the, it was under occupation. He was um, lucky enough or fortunate enough to had uh, or manage to get out of the city before the Russian occupant mm -hmm. came to the place. So, but right after he also came back, like me, and was with, uh, was looking at his. Um, flat and he just recently found out that there's nothing left of it and also these moments were very important because a lot of people were focusing on all the dead people and for me in this particular moment was very um, important to the uh, to focus on the survivors mm -hmm. and meet them and to give them space and to uh, interact with them and um, mm -hmm. to also to give some kind of some short moment of, let's say, I'm not giving them hope, but in general to give some mm -hmm. kind of um, hope. But actually also in this picture is for me um, visualized this um, somehow lost connection between the viewer and the, mm -hmm. and the, and Andre. Mm -hmm. So it's not like this, uh, in a lot of other pictures, I have this direct eye contact and the uh, people are challenging you, uh, challenging you. Uh, what to do or how to react and mm -hmm. there here's like Andre not looking at you and just like I don't know uh, taking a moment yeah, to taking a moment digest to what he what yeah. he has experienced and, yeah and this is also like um, a very strong moment because we are still in this kind of um, situation that mm -hmm. it's like we're discussing every day how to help how to support what to send what to no not send mm -hmm. and I think it's like and he was directly or in, in this kind of moment because he didn't know what to do with himself, but also nobody came to say, ah, maybe you can do this, we can provide something for you. So it, he was just on his own. He, he was, was, yeah. Help, and helpless. it was also very interesting for me because he had this connection also to um, Germany. So he was speaking uh, German. So okay. he's a car, car, car dealer, you car told import, me. export mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. So. Okay. We've already heard uh, that we've we've got two more pictures to to show, um, and then we'll open up uh, for for uh, Irina and Gwendolyn as well. Um, you, we have already heard that you have traveled to Mikolaev as well, and there's one picture you brought from. Mikolaev, and if I'm not mistaken, I mean, for those of you who don't know, um, the city of Mikolaev was under Russian occupation, and uh, it was liberated by Ukrainian forces in November 2022. I think this 
picture was taken earlier, right? You yeah, as uh, Mykolaiv was never under occupation. It, it was wasn't. all the time uh, a frontline city. It was a frontline so, city, yeah. okay. Kherson was occupied, but Mykolaiv was always there. In that time, I was there in um, uh, end of March, it was. Mm -hmm. um, it was heavily bombarded, and I visited uh, the zoo, um, because there was in the city, walking around, working there, speaking mm -hmm. to people. And then I uh, met uh, Viktor Topic, who is the director of the zoo, mm -hmm. and he invited me to come to his zoo, because he and three or four uh, um, co-workers of him, they were, were still taking care of the animals. Mm -hmm. And also the um, zoo was hit by uh, rocket attacks, and... Mm -hmm. um, what we see on the picture is like the um, archive of the zoo and also a missile hit um, the zoo and Viktor Topic decided immediately to bring this uh, leftover of the rocket to his archive to, um, mm. let's say, to, to keep it for the future, to maybe investigate where it comes from, who is responsible for it and stuff like this. But for me, it's also like um, this moment of uh, thinking about what to, what to collect, what to remember, what, what mm -hmm. to, uh, about what to reflect and mm -hmm. so on. And yeah, this is more or less like in mostly all of the pictures, there's like this um, kind of questions how you deal with the conflict, how do you deal with memory, how do you deal mm -hmm. with, um, um, yeah, things mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. We will get back to that on the, on, on the panel. And then last but not least, um, there have been many reports about uh, war crimes the Russian army has committed in Ukraine since February 22. The next picture, if I'm not mistaken, is from Izium. Mm -hmm. um, in the... Kharkiv region, and uh, after the liberation of the area by the Ukrainian army, the, there were, they found graves of about 450 people in the forest uh, next, to, um, next to Izium, and I guess this picture has been taken there. Yeah, um, it's, it's taken in this particular um, forest. Mm -hmm. what, what do we see? What, what moment have you captured? It's after the exhumation of the of the buried bodies, which mostly were killed by the uh, Russian occupants, and yeah, it's it's also this this moment of encounter of um, not hopelessness, but um, um, this this moment of when you don't do not really know what to do. So it's like mm -hmm. it's the whole work is some kind of strange let's say, subjective point of view where you meander by yourself through this, through this country and mm -hmm. encountering all these moments mm -hmm. after one after another. And uh, on this particular gravesite, for me, it was, um, was important to show also this loneliness, but it's also like this, how do we deal with all this murder, with all these, um, yeah, with all these, bodies, like to put mm -hmm. it in a, in a simple way, like um, these people were buried like in a, in a hurry, in a, in a mm -hmm. um, how to say, in a... In an anonymous way? Uh, yeah, in an anonymous way, mm -hmm. sometimes only on the, on the um, crosses there are only numbers. Mm -hmm. So they were exhumated to, to investigate on the crimes, but also to give them a, a proper mm -hmm. um, burial site or proper grave. But it's also like this this strange moment in when do you think like when do you commemorate or um, mm -hmm. the, yeah mm -hmm. about the dead and uh, when does this happen? Do you do it now or do you wait? And what what's happening to these mm -hmm. people? What what is also like the question about memory and how you deal with mm -hmm. it and when is the um, moment for yeah taking really the time to process all this. Mm. Um, also the time to mourn, I guess. Oh, yeah, also, yeah. Mm. Most, yeah. Mostly, yeah. yeah. This brings us, uh, this was a very good introduction into opening up the, the panel uh, for further discussion. Could I ask Irina and Gwendoline on stage? Irina, if you take center stage and Gwendoline, if you... Yes. 
Uh, Irina, we have already heard that you were born in the city of Kharkiv. Um, you started your academic work as a historian there. And for a couple of years, you've been working in Lviv now at the Center for or at the Center for Urban History, which is an institution Kerber Stiftung is very proud to have been cooperating for a couple of years already with. Um, we have, when we talk about Ukraine in, in Germany, um, Lviv is a very important point of departure. We, Lviv has been in the news all the time, ever since February 22. Um, how has the war changed the city of Lviv and, and its inhabitants? Could you tell us a bit about what your observations are? You've been living there since 2015, yeah. I mm -hmm. guess. So how has the city <coughs> changed? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's quite uh, quite an um, interesting question and uh, unexpectedly, you know, of course, uh, when we are talking about the war and thinking about this like huge devastation and really kind of um, very negative impact of it, uh, but also um, sometimes unexpectedly we also see some other effects and uh, in case of Lviv, I think, and also Kharkiv, I think uh, um, we can talk about this uh, like uh, big uh, massive uh, new connections between different parts of, uh, of Ukraine and actually how the Ukrainian nation is built because of uh, Putin's invasion. And uh, for example, in Lviv now, so many people who migrated uh, or who escaped uh, other parts of the country, uh, they are really bringing a new, very vital energy to the city. And for example, several projects um, initiated the integration, for example, of uh, um, uh, artists at risk uh, who came to Lviv and they are welcomed there, provided with some mm -hmm. scholarships and also um, uh, with opportunities to cooperate and to create and to continue their uh, creative projects there in Lviv. And for example, such institutions as uh, Gem Factory Arts Center um, uh, welcomed uh, a couple of thousand of uh, artists uh, from mm -hmm. other parts of the country and they are really creating some new uh, cultural products there. And I think also uh, Lviv is becoming more, uh, I think, uh, uh, tolerant and open and diverse because of that. And, uh, mm. you know, all this conservative uh, Western uh, Galicia with its, uh, you know, more religious uh, milieus, etc. So now it uh, becomes um, much more challenged uh, in a very positive way, I think. Uh, but also, I think what is uh, quite common for uh, not only for Lviv, but also for the cities in the East, uh, and um, um, I think it very much refers to your Robin uh, photographs, I think it's really this imagery of uh, resilience and resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think these two words are key for uh, visual representation of, of the cities today. And for example, when I'm thinking about Kharkiv, I think one of most iconic representations of the city is this uh, main square with uh, almost totally destructed uh, uh, like regional administration building, which was hit by the rocket. But uh, next to it, uh, you can see, for example, some performances like people uh, continuing um, uh, training uh, or uh, performing yoga classes next to this uh, rocket, which is actually in the mm. ground. And uh, there you, ha you have this uh, kind of um, typical big city lifestyle practice as uh, yoga practice, you know, mm -hmm. and these photographs are circulated <laughs> very widely. Mm, and I also think, uh, talking about these uh, cities like Borodyanka, Irpin, cities you mentioned, I think one of most uh, typical images from these cities are very often uh, survivors, uh, like people uh, as survivors, but also objects as survivors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why like your photographs are very, very uh, interesting, and I think they are really catching this essence of uh, how the cities live. Uh, so, mm -hmm. for example, images of some objects which survived uh, the rocket strikes, or, uh, uh, for example, pets uh, like cat, or I don't know, a cup which survived uh, the rocket strike, or which survived uh, the even I don't know the battlefield in in the city. I think th that is a very 
powerful images, and I think uh, it is something common for, for uh, different cities in Ukraine. Mm. Gwendolyn, um, Irina has mentioned resilience as a key factor of, um, and that's also what we observe when we look at Ukraine uh, for f throughout the last year now, uh, the resilience is striking. And also, Irina said that uh, the, the, f the feeling of the sense of belonging together of Ukrainians as a nation has become, obviously has become stronger uh, since, the, f since the, the Russian invasion. Would you say that this is something, um, this resilience, uh, wh where does the resilience come from, from, from your observation? You've been looking into Ukrainian population, into sociology, into politics uh, quite intensively. So what is the origin of the Ukrainian resilience? Mm -hmm. Of course, at the moment, I'm only observing from the outside. Yeah. And unlike both of you, um, since last February, I haven't been on the ground. But f what we can see very clearly is this resilience and uh, resistance. And it's military resistance, but it's also um, civilian resistance. And I think that is the aspect that has um, surprised many outside of Ukraine. Um, and it is obviously the test when something like this happens, it, we can't clearly predict that there will be this kind of resistance before something like this full-scale invasion happens. But I think, and, and this is partly what my research has also been about, um, the component parts were all in place. And I think uh, from outside, um, that wasn't seen because maybe not enough people actually looked um, deeper into Ukrainian society. And um, also given that this war um, is going on since Russia's war against Ukraine is going on since 2014, these are not um, sudden changes that happened since last February. Of mm -hmm. course, it has um, reinforced many trends. Um, but even also before 2014, we can, when we, when we study um, uh, poli political attitudes, um, s look at civic engagement, think about um, t at least two rounds, but there were more, but two rounds of mass mobilization in 2004, the Orange Revolution, then 2013-14, the Euromaidan, when hundreds of thousands of people go into the street, and it's mainly, in, in, the, in particular in the early phases, about um, uh, kind of protest against corrupt uh, presidents at the time and corrupt elites, and that was sentiment was carried in the whole of the country. It's not these were not movements that started only and were only limited to Kiev or, or Western Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, a president like Yanukovych was as unpopular at the time, not when he was elected, but at the time in the south and east of Ukraine. So from outside, um, often it, it looked like, or it shouldn't have looked like, a divided country. So both political Politically, as well as in terms of what what society was like, that there was a very strong sense emerging, and you can really trace this very clearly in, in engagement attitudes and, and all the rest of it, um, that there was a clear understanding already, uh, and it got clearer and clearer, what it meant to, to be a Ukrainian citizen, you know, and to have an idea about the state. Um, uh, not that all state institutions functioned well, that's not what I mean by that, but a sense of um, uh, also the political model that this, this um, state should one day become. And that was already, um, I think, um, very well developed. And so it's not true in my view to say, which we sometimes hear, that the Ukrainian nation is finding itself in front of our eyes since February last year. No? So that's actually um, neglecting all the developments that were in place. And, mm -hmm. and also, in, in, in recent years, that trend could be seen that it's not... Um, Ukraine had a vibrant civil society, but it's not only, only in quotation marks, um, civil society in the sense of organized NGOs, of which there were many, and, and also primarily national ones. So you can also have a lot of NGOs that, that only exist because um, they're, they're funded from outside. So Ukraine was already different in that sense, but you also had um, uh, an incredible amount of, um, in English you would say, um, uh, voluntary engagement, so volunteerism. And this is, of course, individuals in a not very institutionalist way doing all kinds of things in society. Um, and that was also enhanced during the pandemic because people had to. This is not only, <laughs> only by choice. But these are all component parts that made it possible to then, I think, channel this engagement and also this vision for what the state should one day be 
aren't, of course, plus an existential threat, as we've seen in the pictures, to the state and the nation. Otherwise, you wouldn't attack cultural heritage as well, like you do, or like the Russians do. Um, and, and that are component parts that then get channeled into this, this resistance. Um, mm -hmm. and, and obviously, then the full-scale invasion is the test of that, and it comes together. And just to give maybe a few other examples, which really struck me that, I mean, almost, I think, every or maybe every individual is, in, in, is doing something from crowdfunding for replacing mm -hmm. generators for, to repair what you showed the destruction of, um, mm -hmm. uh, re reconstructing all the time what's being destroyed, um, raising money for drones, raising uh, IT experts, developing apps that spot the drones. And it's a, the, the type of engagement, everybody in their own sphere, what they are, their experience teases or in front of their house or half destroyed or completely destroyed house. That's an incredible phenomenon, but there are roots um, to this. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's important to keep that in mind. It's not all brought on only, only in quotation marks by the, by the invasion. Mm. Robin, have you also observed this? I mean, you've been traveling to Ukraine f since 2010. We've heard that. Um, have you observe this, uh, let's say, this, this civic participation and this sense of belonging? Was that, because in the German debate very often we heard about, as Gwendolyn was saying, Ukraine is a country be split between East and West, and it's, it's you know, th there, wasn't a, there, wasn't, there hasn't been a very clear picture about Ukraine. What, what were your observations on the ground? No, I think it was more or less the same. Like maybe in the beginning, like in 2012, when you drive through the through the villages, maybe you have like just in a subjective um, kind of way, you maybe have sometimes the feeling maybe they are a little bit more pro this and contra that. But in general, I would totally second the um, mm -hmm. the sayings of uh, Gwendolyn because um, it was very like the the people were very engaged in their civil society. A lot mm -hmm. of people I met were, um, yeah, like working in the in the cultural um, houses of the of the cities where we're living in. So there was a lot of engagement. We, for example, if you compare it to Germany, we we are lacking. Let's say mm -hmm. so. The people are very, like. Um, how to say, like group orientated, and we're mm -hmm. organizing a lot of stuff. So, mm -hmm. the people I met, it I could really, uh, yeah, I only can mm -hmm. underline this. Yeah. Irina, you've been talking about Lviv and about uh, the the city becoming different in terms of you said more open and more tolerant. That struck me a bit because uh, looking at. Uh, I've been looking at Ukraine also for a couple of years and uh, especially with the Center for Urban History as our partner in Lviv. I always thought that Lviv as a border placed in, situated in a border region with all these multiple heritages of different empires and you know multiple uh, multiple religious tradition and and stuff like that. I thought always that this was the most, the, 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 a very open place, uh, but obviously I, I, I was wrong. So could you just say what, what is different now? Mm -hmm. uh, I think actually it's, uh, it's quite interesting to reflect about this. And uh, I think uh, um, uh, one thing is um, kind of heritage, which is there in Lviv, but which was more like a potential. And how this potential is, uh, is actually uh, um, um, shown itself uh, today. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's obvious when, for example, for uh, so many migrants who came to the city, culture and heritage play plays a very big uh, integrative role. And uh, for, for so many of them, I think different uh, cultural institutions, uh, like in the first months of, of the intervention, like this big scale intervention, uh, these institutions, they just became shelters. Mm -hmm. So they all totally like gave their spaces just for sleeping. So they just oh. welcomed people to, to live, uh, you know, in the theaters and museums and cultural hubs and the libraries everywhere. You just uh, had people just sleeping basically on the floor. 
and uh, uh, later, when it was already not so uh, such a pressing need for this, uh, cultural institutions started to work more and more with uh, uh, with people who came, and uh, I think uh, uh, this um, kind of um, realization of this potential of uh, uh, multicultural heritage of Lviv is now very much um, uh, um, uh, helpful in this integration. And mm -hmm. also, it's very interesting when uh, some professionals in cultural heritage and, uh, or tourist guides, for example, who are coming to Lviv, and now we already have professionals from other parts of Ukraine who are uh, uh, like representing Lviv for others. So they okay, work so. as professionals, and they feel this heritage already as their heritage, and they really use this integrative force to, to you know, to connect to this city for themselves, but also for others. And that's mm -hmm. that's really, I think, very important to think to which extent. Uh, like this culture is so much powerful so so many people can say okay so now you should give all the all the resources all your energy to survival so you need to provide shelter and food but culture that's what is super vital because mm -hmm. it helps uh, really you know psychologically for your mind it helps you to um, uh, also to connect uh, to a place where you are relocated because mm -hmm. of the war and it's also like uh, so vital could you just roughly give us one brief number, how many internally displaced people are staying in Lviv at the moment? How, how many people are we talking about? You know, uh, now it's difficult to say, but uh, I think that municipality expects uh, that Lviv will become uh, actually like uh, around one million people after the war. So uh, it's uh, uh, officially now, I think it's like 750,000 okay. uh, permanent residents of Lviv. And I think municipality expects that uh, as a result of this war time, it will uh, grow to, to like more than one million. Which is quite substantial. So it's, it's quite yeah. a change. Gwendolyn, I'd like to come back to the image, to our image here that, that we have about Ukraine in Germany and how that has changed. You've, you've published a book uh, last year, in autumn last year, a, a very, uh, I think, a very good book that tries to explain the war against Ukraine, its preconditions and its consequences. And so I've, you've been looking also at the German debate uh, about Ukraine. And what do you think, um, how, I mean, <laughs> U Ukraine, I would say, did not really exist on the mental map of the majority of Germans uh, before 2014, maybe, but, but also maybe not before February 22. Um, how has that image changed since last year? I mean, yeah, it's a big question, and it actually. Yeah, sorry about it. <laughs> no, um, I was half expecting it, um, but it connects. <laughs> sorry, with, uh, it connects with what you were just saying. I mean, uh, yes, and in, I think it's the most tragic way in which a country can arrive on the mental landscape of, I mean, not only Germans, but also Germans, but maybe also beyond in, in Western Europe or, or the West, maybe globally. Um, and I think it is. Uh, there are profound changes in in the perceptions. It doesn't immediately go necessarily with a lot of knowledge about the place. Um, it also doesn't mean that there isn't still a lot of debate. Um, also political positions vary a lot, but I think the impact is profound and it also has to do, or maybe mostly has to do in addition to um, obviously the images we, we have every every day and then the images we don't have every day but that slow us down and really make us focus, the type of pictures you take or the images you presented. Um, but it is really through the movement of people no? and displacement and where you just, the previous question, I mean, just to put that in, in perspective again, I mean, these are estimates and nobody knows exactly, but about between a quarter and a third of the uh, Ukrainian population is, is in movement. Um, and uh, that roughly, I think it's a, over 7 million at least 
inside of Ukraine and then about over 5 million outside. These are rough estimates, but these are huge dimensions. And what you just said or when you answered um, how many are currently in Lviv, I think it's also important to, to say that um, these are movements also across borders. This mm -hmm. is not all permanent uh, displacement and now until the end of the war. And in particular, I think in the Lviv region, that is really in, along the Ukrainian-Polish border, very noticeable. And on the one hand, it, it does something to Ukrainian society. I mean, even in one family, people are all split up. They move, they cross borders. Borders are no longer the physical borders or country borders are no longer the ones that you that 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 matter in as a border in your in your daily life. And it is also made in the way Ukrainian society is sort of transnational in many different ways. And, and, and here the impact is that everybody, and I'm sure everybody in the room here, has encounters with Ukrainians here. And I think that's the most um, profound impact. And, and that goes beyond um, yeah, politicians saying something or academics uh, doing research, but this personal encounter and also as a source of information of what is going on. And I think that, I mean, what comes out of that and what um, political decisions are, are, are made on that basis is the next question, and that's um, um, perhaps not, not entirely clear, but uh, that impact on people's perception, I think, through the presence of images, but also people, is, is, is profound. And it's a sad, I don't know, that wasn't quite your question yet, but maybe also the question goes on, sort of how could this happen? And that is also equally tragic, that I think in the fair, um, or the truth is, is simply that um, in, in many heads, um, in Germany, maybe more than in, in, in other parts of Europe, definitely not so much in, in Central and Eastern Europe, um, the Soviet Union was continued as Russia in the thinking. Mm. And, and that's a very lazy way of co uh, writing history since, or contemporary history. Um, and, and that is the realization now that this is, um, this is a fatal mistake. And a, there was never a very differentiated view, I would argue, in, in politics, but also in, 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 in public debate, when looking at Eastern Europe as this, this region or this space that isn't, isn't really um, defined in, 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 in many people's heads. And even a term like, and academics are also, also guilty of it. I mean, yeah. many academics use the term post-Soviet space a lot. I mean, it couldn't be more not differentiated than that. No, there's some vague space. I mean, what, so. what are we thinking when we're using these terms? We're not thinking. And, and, and so that's, that's part of this, that this, um, uh, and, and those who looked at it in, in a more differentiated way didn't have much space. And that's partly also structurally determined or didn't ask for more space. Uh, I have to also maybe honestly say, to, to change that. And mm -hmm. so that is, that is, I think, a profound impact, but it doesn't um, unfortunately change on the spot what's happening right now. And it mm -hmm. doesn't actually also make for very easy political uh, processes of decision making. Mm -hmm. well, yes, language matters and terms matter, def definitely. And I think we come back to that. But um, Robin, uh, Gwendolyn has mentioned a couple of times now the power of images or the role images play. Uh, for shaping our perception, um, for shaping the public debate about, about uh, Ukraine, about the Russian war against Ukraine. What do you think, as a professional photographer, what is the function of photography and images in the context of the year in war we are talking about? So. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, no, I think for me it's always it's always important to really distinguish between like let's say imagery and um, activism. So I think as an as an as you called me long time observer, I always try to to be some kind of differentiated between between myself and my own thinking and what is what I'm encountering. So I'm always for like to speak from my perspective from my perspective i always try to to challenge the viewer through like um through abstraction so how far can i go until a documentarian image is mm -hmm. still an image which can read mm -hmm. by um by the viewer but at the other time it still works on these thin lines to to as i already said to to challenge but in general, it's very important because, like a lot of people, cannot go to the, mm -hmm. to these places. Some p 
people like me can go. So it's also um, sometimes I was just in Kupiansk and met people on the street and a lot of people were just asking me all the time, like, how is it over there? And they were mm -hmm. just living five kilometers from, mm -hmm. from, from that place I visited, like near to the actually um, uh, fightings or frontline areas. Mm -hmm. So it is also like very important to inform, but it's also for me, it's always important to to um, to provide something more than just the imagery, so it's it can be in the, it can be formulated in some kind of commentary or some kind of challenge or some kind of question mark or something like this. So, therefore, imagery is quite important. Um, so I think one one reason um, we are sitting here is because of images, and I think it's very uh, it's a very fortunate um, development that it can lead to something like mm. this, that we are discussing it here and um, also we are discussing it together and not like one over the other, so mm -hmm. with each other. And yeah, I think an image cannot stop the war, but it can inspire to do it. And mm -hmm. Well, this was the voice of a professional photographer describing uh, uh, describing his work. Uh, there is uh, there, there are lots of images coming from Ukraine also via social media, uh, which is not professional photography. Or, I mean, most of the times it's not, but it's just, you know, documenting what is happening. And um, so is there, there, there's also a very interesting fact, because if you look on, on other conflicts which happened before, it was mm -hmm. always some kind of no-go for, for a lot of media houses to really show um, dead bodies. And mm -hmm. when, when like Butcher, for example, mm -hmm. was liberated, we saw we saw it all over. And I think it was a, like a very important point to really do it because like before, it was always some kind of people were afraid that it's too much for the people to see it. But in this like large scale of um, disastrous or like monstrous uh, mm -hmm. slaughtering of people, I think it was really important to show it. And I think it was also um, a bold move of a lot of magazines to really open up their stories with, with pictures like this. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it also can lead maybe to 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 an oversaturation but i would say because we never had it before in this very mm -hmm. um strong way uh, it was very important and it's like um because of social me social media and this so-called everybody's afraid of this uh, picture flood let's say and i think in this occasion it's very important that we that we have it and this uh, wave uh doesn't stop because if we have no pictures or words about it, so nobody would mm. care. It would be the same like in 2014 or 15. Like it was like one one spark of the conflict. Everybody was looking at it. And then and it then was it like, it was just like, okay, they, they took the crim and then it was more or less mm. gone. Then maybe mm. after some years they were talking about Normandy. Uh, talking Normandy since, format. Uh, mm. Yeah, something like this. Sometimes it came up, but it was not like, mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, Gwendolyn, you said language matters, and you know. The, be, before I go back to Irina, as to your role as a professional historian in times of war, I, I would love I would love to hear from you, um, uh, Gwendolyn. What um, Robin has just um, said that um, uh, there is a difference between 2014, 15, and now. He talked about images, but I would t love to talk about language. Uh, in, at least in Germany, if I remember well, we didn't call it a war back then, 2014, right? Was that that was was that the biggest misperception or? It was one of many misperceptions, mm. and one should have named uh, it clearly like that. Um, but uh, yeah, but there are. Uh, reasons why the perception was different, but I mean, what is what's not a war about annexing a part of um, someone else's territory? That's an act of war. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it, I mean, Western countries said and have continuously said it was a breach of international law, and there were some sanctions enacted at the time. Um, one thought that was a lot. EU sanctions had not been implemented up to that point. We now know that obviously a lot more could have been done and a lot of more would have been possible. But yes, I mean, not. Um, I don't recall um, outside of maybe 
um, some academic circles and obviously in Ukraine it would have been labeled a war that people use the term, but that's exactly the right term to use. And mm -hmm. then it continued with Russia's war in Donbass. That's not a war that's happening inside of Ukraine for some mysterious reason. So it's even saying Donbass war leaves, leaves it vague as well what it is. Um, uh, and it's a continuation of this. And then, then we end up in, uh, and I'm not saying it, it had to happen like this, the full-scale invasion, but nevertheless, these are different phases. They are all parts of Russia's war against Ukraine. And as we're talking about terminology, um, I, I find it hugely problematic that, I mean, every day on the news, we hear the word Ukraine war. Mm. And that's a, I mean, yes, now we use the word war, but if you just hear Ukraine war, it sounds different, um, uh, and Ukraine conflict or Ukraine crisis was another one before. You don't hear that so much anymore, but it obscures what it is and who is fighting this war where. And and I think we should at least sort of name things clearly. And and this is Russia's war against Ukraine because it's against the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian nation. And I think one has to be very clear about that. Mm. Yes, I would I would agree. Uh, Irina, as a historian, you professionally deal with uh, sources, with documentation and interpretation of the past. And um, now you are a historian in the situation of an ongoing war. Um, so the question is, what do you think is the role historians can play? Because usually historians say, well, we are dealing with the past. We do not predict the future. We are not so much into what is happening in the present. We, we work, we look into the past. But that has changed because your subject, I mean, you have been dealing with comm the commemoration of the, of, of the Second World War in Soviet times, you are, you are dealing with Soviet heritage and, and reconstruction and stuff in your professional surroundings. So what would you say, what can historians, what should historians do in the situation at the moment mm. with Russia inv having invaded Ukraine, collecting eyewitness accounts or uh, giving voices to the victims, or what, what can you do? Mm. Yeah, thank you for the question. So yeah, probably for the first time, every historian in Ukraine felt very much needed, you know? So of course, uh, also for this nation building project, which is uh, like society is very much expecting from, from a historian now. But I also think on this level of civic nation building, it's uh, very important, especially this process of uh, documenting the war and archiving the war. And uh, I think it's really quite similar to, for example, Syria, where, he, where actually this uh, possession of an uh, iPhone became a factor in um, uh, this uh, citizenship mobilization when people were, for example, documenting cultural heritage destruction and contributed to its preservation in this way and who actually united through different actions, through social networks and uh, very much uh, like focused on these uh, testimonies. And uh, mm, uh, actually, uh, my institution, Center for Urban History, is very much focused focused uh, now on archiving and document uh, documenting. And also, uh, we, are, uh, we are also supported uh, by uh, Kerber Foundation and other uh, donors in this, and that's really uh, great. Uh, and um, actually, um, <clears throat> for example, uh, from the very beginning, I think already on the 26th of February, it was the first uh, interviews with um, um, uh, displaced persons uh, we were recorded at uh, our center. Uh, also, uh, for example, archiving of social media, which is super challenging, I think, because uh, it's uh, kind of a massive, uh, massive uh, amount of data, amount of data <laughs> you, you need to, to collect and uh, what to collect and what to select and why. It's always uh, a, a, sele a selection and uh, always uh, problematic uh, to think about this. And uh, we, um, uh, we uh, collect and archive, uh, uh, for example, Telegram channels on different sides of this conflict, but also some more specific sources, such as, for example, dreams of the war, which is another direction of our archive. And uh, we ask people to uh, retell their dreams, uh, which are, of course, uh, kind of natural phenomenon, but also social phenomenon. And during the war time, people see or have uh, some other <laughs> kinds of dreams. Mm, and also, 
uh, photographs and we cooperate with uh, photographers all over Ukraine who document uh, realities for us and also some uh, photographs uh, who stay under, uh, under the occupation. And here, of course, we have uh, also these moral dilemmas and ethical dilemmas about uh, use and uh, publicity of these images and to which extent and when uh, we can use it in order not to, uh, to be harmful also for the authors. Mm, but I think also so many other initiatives in Ukraine uh, are uh, really focusing on archiving. Also, I don't know, artistic initiatives started to archive. And also uh, just private citizens, uh, for example, like my uh, friends of mine who live in Kharkiv, uh, they also uh, collect, uh, for example, some remains of uh, missile attacks and create uh, even uh, like big museum collections at their homes, you know. And for them, this is all also a kind of this collection in as an act of possession and act of uh, reclaiming the right for the city, right? So they are not afraid to go to those places where uh, actually a rocket uh, strike happened uh, and they uh, like reclaim their right to be present in this public space. And uh, mm -hmm. also I know that so many initiatives and people, um, uh, for example, started or continued mm -hmm. to collect uh, also items and testimonies from the Second World World War. And this is super surprising that people find it very relevant today, even in very practical terms of survival. So they ask uh, like their relatives and some survivors who are still alive uh, um, uh, about this even uh, very practical uh, things about how they survived occupation and, and the war. Mm. And also, for example, one artistic initiative, uh, they explicitly said that for them it was super important, for example, to upload the profiles of Jewish um, artists uh, uh, during the Second World War who lived in, in the city of Lviv uh, just because uh, now they see that these materials are super relevant. So to talk about, uh, you know, victims, about this uh, experience from the past and about the, um, uh, this kind of solidarity with the people from the past. So that's what I also found, how archiving and uh, documentation can also have this... Uh, um, this um, role in this uh, like human dignity uh, sustaining you know mm -hmm. and how how it's important also for uh, like not for professionals uh, but for 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 just regular people it's you know. it's it's important for both sides i think mm -hmm. just one short question uh, and and kindly ask you to give a short answer are you producing sources for the future or is it also about documenting the atrocities and the experiences that could be used later on when there is a juridical dealing with the, with the war, mm -hmm. um, wherever that's going to happen. You know, yeah, it's a very uh, challenging question because we even cannot predict uh, how many users will be with these materials and we try to be as, as inclusive as we can. And uh, there are so many different initiatives and of course there are some government bodies already to document, for example, um, uh, destruction of uh, physical cultural heritage and also uh, uh, like special, uh, a special uh, kind of uh, law professionals who are attached uh, to the military who come come to, to the places and, and uh, um, uh, work together with cultural heritage professionals in estimation of, of destructions, etc. Mm, and uh, uh, of, of course, uh, we are not uh, um, like explicitly thinking of our collections as, uh, uh, as a, a witness in, in the court and they are not collected in, in that way uh, because for us it's most important to um, uh, actually have uh, uh, like non-traumatic uh, approach Watch to, to people with whom we are talking and you know judicial procedures is very much oriented towards uh, result and not towards uh, the, the very the act of mm -hmm. communication with a human being. But mm -hmm. once again, from the Second World War, we know this, uh, uh, these examples and these cases when artistic products uh, were actually used in, in the court later. And for example, Zuzana Ginchanka, a famous uh, Jewish poet who lived in Lviv uh, uh, during the uh, Nazi occupation, and she was actually reported to police uh, by the uh, house um, uh, uh, house owner uh, and uh, actually uh, Hinchanka wrote a poem 
where she explicitly named the, the name of this uh, um, kind of collaborator with, with the mm -hmm. Germans, and later it was used in Soviet court to uh, actually blame uh, the, the, the house lady. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's uh, and uh, I think all this uh, resonates very much with uh, mm. with the situation in Ukraine, and I I uh, do think that uh, yeah probably we we even cannot uh, predict uh, how this archives will be uh, relevant in mm. the future. I very much like that you said that for the very first time uh, Ukrainian historians, even for a very sad reason, have the, have the feeling that they are very much needed at the moment. I, have, I would like to, to address you, Gwendoline, both Gwendoline and, and, and Robin, maybe uh, in, in this order, because I, I, when I looked at uh, your photograph, Robin, uh, that gave us such an impression about the destruction about what, what is, and devastation. The war is ongoing and Russia has it increased its attacks recently and many expect major attacks to come prior to the uh, uh, anniversary, in quotation marks, of the invasion next week. But on the other hand, uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians show resilience and reconstruct reconstruction is underway. And, and, and the question is, to me, it's very puzzling. Um, how can reconstruction be organized in times of war? I mean, what do we see there? I mean, yes, of course, inf when, if infrastructure is hit, the, the, the electricity uh, is, is, is repaired, and, and of course, this is to, to keep the main infrastructure going. But there, these talks about reconstruction while the attacks are still ongoing, is that also a certain, um, uh, how to say, proof for Ukrainian resilience? Or how do you, how, do, how would you mm -hmm. see that? I don't, actually, it's a good question. I don't even know how in Ukraine, if people talk about reconstruction, do they use the word reconstruction? Or is that something that uh, we use more outside? Um, um, but I think it connects us to the beginning of the discussion, no? so that it's uh, it's daily practice. And I think reconstruction mm -hmm. means many things. Yes, it means infrastructure, but it also means, uh, um, again, sort of crowdfunding for a generator is reconstruction. It's not mm -hmm. uh, kind of big companies reconnecting um, their energy grids. That's also happening, but it's it's it goes down again all the way to society. And reconstruction is also doing doing something in your neighborhood and and, and doing something about your house or your flat or others or so mm -hmm. it's I think it's a very wide notion and it, it captures what's what's going on and it's it, I think it's it's us outside having to understand that reconstruction starts now sometimes when I think politics talks about reconstruction after the end of the war this is how in many wars reconstruction was thought about not that nobody starts reconnecting energy grids during a war but I think it's actually a war where we because the the end is so uncertain and how long it will last is so uncertain that any discussion now about reconstruction, also support for it, in particular financial support, it means it, it starts now and, that's, and it's, it sounds like a contradiction to us outside. No? So how can you reconstruct if you know that tomorrow it might all be destroyed again? Mm -hmm. But that's exactly the point because otherwise if it's not reconstructed today, um, kind of the path after that is, is clearer. So, um, and I think that's that's something that that, that we and also in particular um, politics in in societies and in in the West need to understand that reconstruction starts now. It's part of that process, and it will continue after the end, whenever that will be. And it means we need to think of reconstructing the same thing over and over again, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it. But that mirrors and is only the, the right response to what we see, what Ukrainians are doing every day. And also, I, I think reconstruction goes with many things. We think of infrastructure first, perhaps, and that is important. But it's also um, cultural heritage that's destroyed, mm -hmm. things that are somewhere still protected and, and, and need to be brought to safer mm -hmm. places. It is capturing these memories and documenting what can be documented. So that is all part already of that. Mm. But the, the dimensions are obviously huge. But if one thinks of the overall dimensions, it's it's almost paralyzing, as we can see in these pictures. But if if it's concrete things, uh, it, it it's, mm. I think, becomes somewhat more manageable. Yeah, we, we once had an event here uh, in, uh, where we had a, a curator from Ukraine talking about how cultural 
objects are preserved, you know, being brought away from the museums to protect them from strikes, to be hidden somewhere. We've seen the iconic images from Lviv, I think that was, where they uh, where they protected the, the statutes and 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 the, and the buildings uh, with from from airstrikes. Robin um, Gwendolyn just said reconstruction has to happen now and is happening now. Is that also something that you observe uh, when you are going to Ukraine? Yeah, I think I would say there. Two things, for example, like on my last trip, it was like uh, I was also in Kharkiv and uh, it was not so long ago, like five days ago or something like this. When I was in Kharkiv, I was sleeping more or less in the city center in a small hotel, but also at night there was like a huge um, rocket attack and it was like, um, I think three or four rockets just hit the city, not so so far away, far away from the place I was staying. And the, and the place, of course, a rocket had hit and it burned down, it uh, exploded, it was uh, really destroyed. But f at the one place it was the, the post office and of course you need the post office. So there were already people at six o'clock in the morning already, of course, um, repairing it. Mm -hmm. But um, also on this trip I started from Kharkiv going to the... Um, Kharkiv and uh, Donetsk um, areas, and there are like a lot of a lot of uh, small villages who are completely destroyed, with almost no people living there, and there's nothing being rebuilt. So it's mm. not to blame anybody who's in charge, charge to uh, that I would say they have to repair it. But it's like, um, of course, the energy grids are repaired. It's like you said, it's the, the things which are really needed are, repair, are repaired. But a lot of people are from these fighting areas, for example, they are fled to some other areas and they are mm. uh, hopefully safe there and have a roof over their head. But there are a lot of places which are like, yeah, as I said, completely destroyed. And I don't think that will they will be repaired anytime soon because you never know mm. um, how the how the fighting is um, how the fighting is going. Mm. So yeah, uh, I'd like to do a final round with you here on the panel before I open up to questions from the from the audience. And I was intrigued by what Gwendolyn said. You said. Uh, the war is going on, nobody knows when it's going to end, but as we, are, as we need to start thinking about reconstruction, do we also need to start thinking about post-war Ukraine? And if so, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Yeah, um, but it's obviously not only a sort of a luxury uh, exercise yeah, of outside course. of Ukraine. So to think what what might happen one day, and obviously, as you rightly said, no entire we focused on the reconstruction and on the resistance, but entire parts are destroyed and not really inhabited and won't be probably for a long time. That's mm, a sad yeah. truth as well. No? So, so I think that's um, that that will be one part of the post-war reality, and another one is, and that again concerns in a way us outside of Ukraine as well. I think it's a. Uh, I mean, most Ukrainians, I think, um, who who were displaced, um, think of returning and rather returning tomorrow than the day after tomorrow. But the reality will also be that that's not possible, and and uh, then that requires. I mean, all of us Ukrainians, but also um, non-Ukrainians, to think of how how can people be part of um, kind of this rebuilding, which is not reconstruction in the sense of rebuilding everything the way it looked. That's impossible, and and would also probably be the the wrong response. So it has to be done differently, and you will need and to include um, uh, people and the expertise um, elsewhere as well. So. I think one important part of this uh, thinking about um, um, post-war Ukraine, but then again, it already starts now as well. In, in every sphere, you've, you've highlighted in terms of this, this need, this urge to try and document, be it through picture, in, images, be it through research. As a social scientist, I feel the same. There are many initiatives. And, and one effect has been, I think, a lot of these efforts are much more connected. And there are networks existing now that, I mean, ideally, they would have existed before February last year, but they didn't to this extent. And they go across, if we look at academia, across disciplines, across different countries, places. So, 
mm-hmm. and I think that is sort of the, this momentum to think about um, to maintain that and, and involve mm-hmm. um, individuals, but also scholars, other expertise, um, mm-hmm. um, entrepreneurs that are now outside need to do in a way their their bit. So I think it's it's a lot about this um, that on the one hand society in Ukraine is is profoundly changed even in its makeup right now, obviously. Mm-hmm. But then some of that will not quickly return to some sort of normality, if that was what we want to call it. So then we need to think in very different ways about um, um, how individuals and different types of expertise and networks that now exist and are connected can can work for this post, post-Soviet, yeah. uh, post-war uh, Ukraine. <laughs> Irina, um, what will be the main consequences of the current war for post-war Ukraine? What do you think? We've been, you've already talked about uh, identity changes or the Ukrainian people getting closer together. So what will be the main consequence from your point of view? Mm-hmm. I think what uh, what we can observe already now that of course one of most important uh, factors is that uh, civil society is gaining more and more weight and uh, also especially when we are talking about uh, volunteers and uh, veterans I think their role will be like super substantial as in every country after the war mm, and I think um, thinking about this uh, reconstruction it's also obvious that uh, already there are several ongoing uh, or even many <clears throat> different uh, like phases of uh, reconstruction or uh, ways to, to reconstruct and I'm thinking for example of uh, such an uh, initiative uh, as uh, for example initiative called uh, uh, Build Ukraine Together or BUR in Ukrainian and this is a volunteer initiative of uh, mostly young people who are coming to different uh, places which were hit by the, by okay. the war mm. and uh, they have a kind of building camps there also involving local people in to a rebuilding of uh, just housing or some um, public buildings there. And uh, uh, this is really kind of a grassroots uh, initiative and, and uh, uh, also internationally supported uh, financially. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, I think, a, a, an image of how you can build this future Ukraine as a kind of cooperative project and project uh, which, is, uh, which is really a kind of grassroots and, and horizontal. Uh, or, for example, if you think about uh, another initiative in the one of Rankivsk, uh, which is called uh, Kohati, or kind of co-housing, or maybe also Ukrainian word uh, Kohati, which means just to love. Uh, and uh, it uh, actually is oriented towards uh, um, uh, adaptive reuse of uh, unused uh, buildings for uh, housing for displaced uh, people. And uh, it's, of course, a vision of the future of Ukraine as a green future, right? So it's idea of circular economy. And uh, once again, they also engage people who will live in this uh, in this uh, houses uh, later. So it's also kind of this cooperative way to, to rebuild, to reconstruct. But uh, if you take a very different uh, approach to reconstruction, uh, to reconstruction, as uh, for example Norman Foster suggestion mm. to uh, kind of uh, reconstruct Kharkiv from above, kind of very vertical idea of uh, kind of superstar, international superstar coming, kind of uh, from mm. above and giving the city a beautiful new master plan for its development, uh, which will be just perfectly fitting and based on, you know, scholarship and best expertise and, uh, uh, of course, in close cooperation with the municipality but with very little uh, kind of participation or feedback from the local people. And uh, I think that uh, all these different ways of uh, reconstruction will be present in the future and uh, probably we cannot avoid also mistakes which were done in all these vertical uh, processes of reconstruction, for example, on Balkans in the past after this Balkan Wars uh, or in some other places when these huge, huge uh, funds <coughs> were coming and really changing the game on, on the spot. And of course, we, 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 we will probably see uh, like quite a diverse mm. approaches in different, in different cases. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I must say it feels very surreal to me. I know that we need to talk about reconstruction and post-war, but it feels very surreal because we Ukraine is under attack every day and every night. And you know, it's uh, I'm struggling with that 
uh, to be honest. I, need to, I, I, I know that we need to develop a vision for the future. Ukraine needs to have a vision for its future, but it's very difficult, I think, to, to talk about that at the moment. So um, the floor is up to questions from the audience. Um, if you would be so kind to formulate questions rather than statements, be short and address them to one of our three speakers, I would be very grateful. You can ask uh, in either in English or in German, if that's easier for you. If you ask your question in German, I'd quickly translate for Irina so that she's uh, comfortable. So I have two wonderful colleagues with microphones I saw one hand here in the front, so please, the floor is yours, and while you are asking, the others can think about their questions. Actually, I wanted to say, to give a remark about, uh, the, about the footage, about the footage of of um, oh, Can you just uh, introduce yourself briefly? I'm very I, sorry. So, my name is Valerio. Mm -hmm. I was a coordinator for the University of Hamburg. Mm -hmm. And Russian is one of my for my target foreign languages. Mm -hmm. And over the course of the war, I have almost I have also collaborated with several colleagues of mine to mm -hmm. uh, to to give a full reportage of videos as well as photographs of as well as photos in lifetime taken straight from Kiev and other Ukrainian cities during the war. Mm -hmm. And this is in fact a topic which. Uh, will, uh, which also can become personal mm -hmm. for several reasons. And given I, given it's now I have a little time to give this remark, I decided I would, I would convert it into a question. It's about uh, the importance of the footage of the devastation in Bucha. Do you agree with the fact that uh, this footage not only has helped the West to break this taboo, but do you also think that it also helped, remarkably it helped to do give a full picture of the devastation in Ukraine after the initial fog of war, and most importantly, to show that the Russian propaganda, the Russian propaganda was entirely built on lies. Mm. Okay, so I think that was a question to, to the photographer mm. uh, first. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for the question. I, I would try to, to say something <laughs> um, towards it. Um, um, yeah, I think it's it was like um, as you already said. I think it was important to also break like the propaganda who's saying like it's like a military special operation. It's for the liberation. It's for the good of the people and so on. And I think therefore it was good. But it's also if you only say this, it's also on the back of the people. So I think it's really about the the tragedy which was which was so shown and um, made. Um, public, and I think this is more more the important point. Not to really break the propaganda or or deal with this is like really to to make it very well and widely known that it happened. So I think it's um, if if yeah, this is what I would say. So uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it 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 links back to what you have said mm. about your picture um, uh, about the the. The no, the graves, yeah. uh, you know, giving giving the victims. Yeah, dignity. I think it's not, not 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 important. Yeah, this is the main point. It's ha it has to be or it has to give the people their dignity. It wouldn't have been so um, wise or whatever to show really the faces or like the wounds mm -hmm. or whatever. But I think it was like most of the pictures were like very. Um, yeah. To. Yeah. Redignify the, yeah. the the victims. Is there are there any more questions? There is a young colleague in in the back. Microphone is coming. If you would, would also kindly introduce yourself briefly. Yeah. Uh, hi. My name is Philip, and I'm probably one of the persons who hasn't really had any awareness about Ukraine before February last year. Mm -hmm. Not uh, my usual kind of field. So. But um, I have a question for Irina, and um, I've heard that uh, Ukrainians and Russians considered themselves sort of brothers before. 
um, February. And now around Christmas, I've heard that a lot of people changed habits, for example, celebrated the Christmas, like Western style Christmas, 24th mm -hmm. of December, 25th of December, rather than beginning of January. What do you think um, all this could affect the Ukrainian sort of traditions and cultures moving forward? Mm -hmm. That's a very important one, mm -hmm. Irina. <coughs> Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I think in general it's uh, talking about the importance of language. It's quite uh, important to also reflect on these metaphors which we use for uh, description of, uh, you know, international relations or some societal processes and this metaphor of uh, brothers. I think it's also very kind of bodily uh, imagination about the nations, right? So we, we use this metaphor of uh, kind of uh, human bodies. I don't know, like you have brothers, it does mean that you have uh, like common DNA, so it's a very, I think, like problematic uh, thing for a, uh, for a researcher, uh, of course, to, to deal with this kind of metaphors when uh, you are bringing this um, like typical, I don't know, human or bi biological uh, traits uh, to whole societies, right? And of course, it was a huge uh, uh, Soviet uh, propagandist uh, cliche about certain peoples as being brothers, and uh, this, of course, implied that there are certain Certain other peoples or nations which are not <laughs> brothers and which are, I don't know, eternal enemies, probably. You know, as for example, I don't know, American uh, nation is probably not the brother. And uh, of, of course, of uh, Russia, you of mean. Russia, or mm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, for me, But for me, of course, all the nations are brothers, and uh, I would love, I don't know, all the nations of the world to unite into one state. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, in 2014 and 15, Ukrainians uh, discovered that uh, state and nation are very important and still in this post-national world when uh, nation state is constantly criticized and of course civil society is growing and struggling against uh, the, the state and against the state uh, uh, monopoly for many things. But uh, I think uh, uh, Ukraine also rediscovered this for, for the whole world that still nation state matters and, uh, and uh, uh, national borders are very important and they are exactly important also for uh, uh, safety of, of civil society and human dignity and human rights. So they are not opposite. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not <laughs> answering yeah, your yeah, question. Yeah, I, I think, uh, so I think uh, the, question, the reason for the question was yeah. a different one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, but it triggered me. <laughs> um, yes, we, we, we could see that. <laughs> yeah, so I think, yeah, but uh, let all the nations be, be sisters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, so about the, <laughs> <laughs> but about the celebration, I think uh, it was a long uh, process uh, also before the war. And, uh, uh, but yeah, now I think it's quite a uh, mark marker that uh, this is more kind of uh, Western uh, marker and uh, kind of joining of Western civilization. It also means this uh, different calendar. And I think for, for many people it uh, functions as a certain manifestation also of a personal choice uh, in, in language and also in, in calendar and some other uh, kind of everyday life uh, habits, uh, because uh, now uh, this national identity is not only for uh, some kind of external use or, or some kind of uh, representational mm -hmm. uh, functions, but also for kind of internal and very intimate decisions, mm -hmm. for example, to change the language, to change, I don't know, food habits, uh, and to change uh, even ways to celebrate in your family, right? Mm. So now it's taken uh, much deeper. It has become very political now, yes. Gwendolyn, <laughs> you wanted to add on that. I just triggered something in me too because we talked several times about language and I mean the the term that is is really a Soviet create or Russian and Soviet also already imperial Russian and then Soviet uh, creation is actually little brother no so it's immediately it's not uh, not brother on equal an equal footing it, it, it was never that it's it's the little brother and then it's the Slavic notion and adding Belarusians to that perhaps too and and I don't think I've ever met a Ukrainian who ever described themselves as a brother so it was a very uh, of um, of Russians or in that Soviet sense, so it was a, it, it's something that is that is sort of imposed from from outside. So that it it sounds like a nice notion, but it's it, it in its in its in its way as a little little brother, it's ascribed from outside and from the top down, and and not really used in in society. Mm. 
No, but one thing that Irina has, and, and also you have tackled is, I mean, that belongs to the consequences of the war. I mean, language and habits and culture have become very political now. And uh, if to use Russian language in Ukraine, even if you are, uh, a bo if, you, if, you, if that was your mother tongue or one of your two mother tongues that has been become very politicized at the moment, as far as I, I, I reckon from the development. I think I've seen the, another question. Yes, please. Yes, hello, my name is Lawrence. Um, I have a, a question uh, to Gwendolyn. Because uh, um, you stated that uh, Ukraine was somehow a blind spot uh, for a lot of um, people, especially in Western Europe and in Germany. And now uh, everybody is like, um, working with this narrative, as you already mentioned, like the resilience, the heroism of the, of the, the people in Ukraine fighting against uh, the Russians. Do you see that there is somehow the next big potential in this narrative of the resilience becoming some sort of a blind spot in our minds because we somehow neglect like the price the people have to pay and that we as western europe uh, have a responsibility as you also stated that we never even were able to call the war a war when it started in 2014 and now we somehow uh, when hopefully the war will end soon we can all say oh the the the, the heroic uh, Ukrainians, they fought the war, we supported them with our weapons, and that's it, and uh, it's forgotten. Uh, do, you, do you share this uh, opinion? Or? Yeah, and I think it's, uh, sorry, can I answer? Yes. Um, yeah. it, I think that's a really important point, and, and I think we focused a lot, and I think rightly so today, on, on resilience and resistance, and to try and explain what forms it takes and why it's there in the first place, because it seems that has surprised many ma many people. But of course, that's, that's, that's true, and I, I mean, I think in one sentence, um, mm, resilience alone will not bring this war to an end. So, I mean, U Ukrainians can put all the, up the, all the resistance, civilian and military, on their own. It will not, in my view, end this war. So without um, kind of the, the other side of this, without uh, Western uh, military, financial, humanitarian assistance, um, this uh, uh, will not end in a way that maybe our discussion, if we focus on the resilience and the resistance part, um, uh, um, uh, how, how this might end. So I think that's really important, and that's um, mm, yeah, that's the that's the truth. I completely agree with that, and that's uh, was I think in parts in our discussion about reconstruction, but it also has this military component, and we can't get mm -hmm. get away from that in this context. Mm -hmm. Yes, peace is more than the absence of war. Exactly. So there was a question uh, of a gentleman here. Microphone is coming. My name is Günther, and I would like to ask Irina, how do you react to requests from the civil society, also academic people in Germany, saying that diplomacy is not doing enough, there should be negotiations now, the war has to stop? Mm -hmm. Yes, very, very good question, and Irina is going to answer that, and then I think we that was, we, we closed the, the Q&A. Irina. Uh, yeah, quite difficult to, to say. So, you know, uh, I'm personally, of course, uh, if, I, if, if I can, I don't know, st um, initiate any negotiation process which can be fruitful, so I would, of course, do it immediately. Uh, and I think even the President Zelensky before the election, uh, so his position about the uh, war in Donbass uh, was that uh, uh, we need to uh, meet together with Putin and look uh, into his eyes and uh, really ask uh, what, uh, what he wants and we need to decide to stop this war. And actually Zelensky, uh, I think he won the elections uh, exactly because one of his uh, most important uh, promises was to stop the war, to bring peace and, uh, and uh, uh, so it does mean that uh, Ukrainian political elites uh, were very much oriented towards uh, uh, stop, uh, stopping this war and of course uh, um, um, it, it, this idea just proved uh, not uh, really um, working and uh, actually as you remember probably this first uh, couple of months uh, of uh, this full scale invasion uh, the negotiations were, uh, were going on between Ukraine and Russia but 
exactly when this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, mass crimes in Bucha were discovered. This was the point when the negotiations were stopped and the idea that uh, Ukraine need to, uh, to really win uh, on the battlefield first and only then we can have any negotiations uh, with, with, uh, with Russia um, uh, came uh, into the fore. And uh, uh, it really turned out that uh, this is impossible to, to really have any negotiations because they are only used uh, by, by the Russian side to, uh, uh, to accumulate more of resources and more of weapons to really uh, once again to attack. So unfortunately, this idea proved uh, to be not, uh, not really effective and, uh, and also in the face of, or in the face of, um, of uh, what we saw in, in places like Bucha, Izum, uh, Kupiansk and so many other places, it is obvious that, uh, that uh, Putin's regime is not uh, actually, uh, um, uh, is not, uh, uh, is not a, an entity with, with which you can, can really negotiate about anything. Mm -hmm. Gwendolyn, uh, I've just said peace is more than the absence of war. What does that mean for Ukraine? In the case of Ukraine, from your point of view, the last word goes to you tonight. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no it oh, yes. Oh, you. Robin. No, it, it should go to Irina, I think. Um, mm. I mean, it means, I mean, basically, the perspectives get, perspective gets even longer then. No? So it means we already have, at the moment, no way of seeing to the end of this war. And then what comes next is still mm -hmm. um, a very long and very uncertain phase. If we call it reconstruction, that also sounds somehow maybe like a euphemism. So um, it, it then raises questions. I mean, I, I following on from where you left off, uh, I mean, it's not that there are not um, kind of contacts to Russia or to Putin directly. I mean, I think the moment, uh, it, it's important to see if there is a moment where something shifts and diplomacy can play a part. But at the moment, because these contacts are there, it's also not true that we always should say diplomacy is one thing and then military assistance is the other. And also they, they, they need to go together and there are contexts that try and I think it's right. Um, sometimes uh, politicians get um, immediately criticized when they make phone calls. You can't miss the moment if something politically shifts in Russia. At the moment, there's no sign of it and there's no political will for any kind of negotiations. But maybe that w one day might change, probably after more developments on the on the battlefield. But then beyond that, if, if, if that even is how far we can think, and like you, I, I can't quite think um, um, that far yet. Um, what comes next, that, that sort of peace, whatever that looks like, um, needs to be guarded, needs to be um, secured as well, too. So that's, these are huge issues then. How will um, uh, Ukraine's security and as a result also uh, European security um, be guarded in the future? So what we, what we have in terms of international law or other, I mean, agreements, bilateral, multilateral agreements, they have failed. And international institutions, also international institutions like the UN, can't um, uh, um, manage this, kind of, they don't function. So then what comes to actually guard that and to actually get to what you're outlining with that phrase is, is even bigger. No? But I think we sense at the moment that something, dramatic things will have to change, but what they are and how we get there, I think mm -hmm. is really unclear. Mm -hmm. That wasn't really an answer, but just making it even bigger. <laughs> yeah, making it even bigger. Yeah, sorry about it. Uh, sorry for putting that question uh, to you at, at the end. Um, I think what we've seen is that we all struggle. We struggle with the situation, but we, as Gwendolyn said, we are in the luxury position of observing it from, from here, of uh, showing empathy uh, to Ukraine and Ukrainians, of trying to support and to help. But uh, you, Irina, and your colleagues and, and the Ukrainians, uh, you are in the middle of, 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 of the war. Um, you are not observing, you are experiencing the war, which, is a, which makes a huge difference. And uh, I would, if I could uh, use, misuse my position as a moderator at the very end, I would say what I would wish 
for the for 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 the future for let's say the next couple of months and 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 years to come because nobody knows how long this war will go on and how long and we have we have seen that we will we will deal with ukraine uh, for for quite we have to deal with ukraine for 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 a very long time what i would wish is a very humble wish is that we don't lose the awareness uh, here uh, in Germany, in our civil society, that we don't stop to look at Ukraine and what's happening there. We don't stop to support and to help the people of Ukraine, be it refugees who come to us, be it people who stay in Ukraine, be it academias, be it artists, uh, so that we that the level of solidarity remains. Uh, I think that that's important uh, because there is so much news and so much, so many catastrophes in the world. It's I think it's very important to keep focus on Ukraine because this is not only about Ukraine. This is about us as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks to all three of you, and uh, please feel invited to continue discussion uh, outside. We have prepared a little drink, a glass of wine, if you like, and um, continue to talk about what you've heard. And I wish you an insightful and nice evening. Thank you very much.